All right, so now that we've seen how we can do authorization within an application, making these tiles appear and disappear and vanish at will based on the user's attributes and do filtering of some data, we can take a look at the policy behind it that was actually um, driving this behavior. So I'm gonna switch over to our Axiomatics policy server and go into the policy management module and we can take a peek at various sections of this policy. We're not gonna walk through the whole thing. Sorry to disappoint you. We're not gonna make this a training class, but I just wanna highlight a few things of, of what's going on here to give you an idea of the types of things that can be done with a policy-driven approach. And I will also state that we have a couple of different policy editors. I'm also using our web-based graphical one now because it shows much easier, but we also have editors that are more developer uh, focused and those tools produce more of a pseudocode. And yeah, mess that one up. So we have more, we have other policy editors that develop, that the de more developer friendly and those are written in, in pseudocode for them. But for now, we're gonna stick to this graphical representation. So I've opened up what we call a rule. And this is what was giving access to insurance agents to view uh, insurance claims. So we have a couple different things going on here. So when someone asks to see insurance claims, we're saying, okay, who can see insurance claims? Well, one of the personas that can see an insurance claim is an insurance agent. So we're doing a check here. Is the user's role insurance agent? And, that, and we saw that in the directory service when I changed their role from insurance agent to person, their access has vanished. Now, some of you may be saying, wait a minute, you're, you're using a role. I thought this was an attribute-based access system. Well, role is just another attribute. And we also understand that roles are not going away. They've been around for a long time. Organizations are dependent on them. So we're going to use them. We're not going to make you throw out your roles. We will, however, encourage you to reduce the number of roles that you have. And you'll find by going to an attribute-based access control system, you will not need as many roles. Thus, the roles you have remaining will be a little bit easier to manage. So this is our, our first level check, if you will. We're checking your role. Now, once we know your role, we're saying, all right, which claims can you see? Well, you can see the claims where the claims region equals the users region. And we saw this when we moved Laura from Chattanooga to, to Memphis. Her, the information she saw change, and this is where that came from. So our system can dynamically go look up her region like we saw from the directory. You'll find out what it is. So this is what dictates whether she can see it or not. You'll notice we don't write Laura's name in the policy. We build a relationship. We build something about the user's attributes and how it relates to the resources attributes, in this case, a claim. So there's the claim region equals the user's region. And it can take a lot of different forms. I mentioned uh, citizenship checks, you know, does the claims country classification equal to user citizenship? Uh, for governments, this can be security clearances, right? Does the, does the data security classification, you know, is that less than or equal to the user's security clearance? This is all driven around relationships between the users and the resources. So does the user's uh, region equal to claims region, then they're allowed to do it. And we'll see this pattern repeated over and over. For example, can customers can view their own claims. So for ex let's uh, take a look at the medical records that we looked at earlier. We're going to see the same type of thing going on here, where if we look at this rule that says members can view their own records. It's a very similar pattern we have going on here. We're checking the user's role. Are they a customer? Alice was a customer. That's why she was able to see that. And now we're seeing which ones can she see? Well, she can see the records where the medical records patient log on is equal to this attribute subject ID. So the subject ID attribute is the user's identifier. So in our example, it was their login name, could be, but it could be any other identifier you have in your environment. 
that we're doing this relationship for. Again, notice we're not writing Alice's name in here. We're comparing something about her, in this case, her logon name, to the patient logon name of the data. And this is what grants her access to that. It's all about relationships. This is what makes these policies very scalable. And it also makes them very static, meaning um, they're not changing. Once you write your authorization requirements, you're not coming in here and updating policies every day. You're only coming in here and updating policies when things change. So for example, when we first wrote this demo, only members and doctors can view patients. Then we added a new requirement of members can view records um, they have been granted consent to see. So we added this notion of a consent table. So we looked up who has been consented what, and we compare that with your subject ID. So we made a change and deployed that change out. But if your requirements aren't changing, well, your policies are static and you're not uh, having to go through policy updates, policy edits, and policy changes on a daily basis. These are going to stay static unless you're onboarding a new use case, onboarding new applications, or the government issues new regulations that you need, that you need to comply to. So you don't have to worry about this is something you're going to be in all the time. Uh, granted, if when you're first getting started, you're adding new policies, of course, you're going to be changing them. But once you're deployed, these are going to be static. 